And here tonight, we have Dr. Todd West, who is the head of the nationally acclaimed Woody Plant Improvement Program of North Dakota State University. And Todd's going to share with us his insights on best flowering shrubs for North Dakota. So Todd, welcome to the forums. All right. Well, thank you, Tom. Pleased to be here. We good. All right. So first, you know, we're going to do a little bit of background information. This is going to seem redundant, kind of dumb, but what's the difference between a tree and a shrub? So a tree is defined as a woody plant with one main stem, generally 15 foot tall, having a distinct head. Whereas a shrub, you're looking at a multi-stem, uh, generally, again, under 15 foot tall. But then we get into that gray area, especially now with the tree forms, where they're putting all the shrubs on a standard, a single stem, what they call that standard, grafting it up high or training it up high. So we get that uh, lollipop, that shrub on a stick. So just starting out here, we mentioned spring's on its way. So here's one of the first uh, signs of spring is forsythia. Beautiful shrub for about a week of the year. Uh, the other 99% of the time, eh, maybe not so good looking. But now, hey, look at there. Now we got a shrub on a stick. Uh, so this is what they call uh, the standards. Uh, and a lot of the shrubs are ending up this way now. So we'll touch on this uh, a couple times during the presentation. So why do we plant shrubs? So we can use it for screen. We can use them for direct traffic. We unify the space. Uh, basically the sprinkle effect uh, on, on the cupcake. We really bring the landscape together. Uh, we can save space. We know yards are getting smaller, especially in the urban environment, and so we can fit uh, more plant material in a smaller space. That uh, photograph you see there, you can, uh, in the bottom right, shows that uh, standard, that shrub on a stick kind of an idea, but allowing us to fit some really beautiful horticultural plants in a much smaller spot. And then dealing with the aesthetics. We have the foliage, we have the flowers. That's what we're gonna be talking a lot about tonight, obviously with flowering shrubs, but then also some fruit as well, because with flowers, we often uh, get some fruit and we wanna talk about that. So here's a, you know, a nice landscape, uh, bringing things together. The thing that's missing here though is some color. You know, they do have shrubs, they have evergreens, they have deciduous, we have some trees, we have some multi-stem, we have some conifers. You know, there's a little bit of everything here, but not a lot of color. It's all shades of green. And what we want to avoid is the cookie cutter landscape. What we typically get with uh, the builders today, where you're going to get the same three things, you're going to get your one little autumn blaze maple out front, and then nothing too exciting. So we want to avoid that. So some qualities that we want to look for in shrubs, uh, predictable size and form, that's what makes them nice, rapid growth rate, ease of transplant and establishment, minimal litter, we want to make sure they're not causing mess in our landscape. We love gardening, but we don't want to garden too much, right? Uh, resistant to attack by p uh, pests and disease, obviously we don't want to bring problems to our gardens. Uh, Non-allergenic, you know, a lot of people can be allergic to the pollens. Uh, and so we have to be careful with that. Uh, tolerant of a wide range of environmental conditions, again, depending on where we have them in our landscape. And then uh, excellent aesthetic features, and we also want to make sure we're not dealing with invasives. So some criteria, function, design elements, site conditions, plant features. Tonight's main focus is plant features. Uh, so some of those features, foliage, flowers, fruit, bark. I know I'm going over this pretty quick, but we're just going to focus on the flowers tonight. We could talk about these other features, but uh, the main thing really with shrubs is that we kind of want to have a multi-season interest. You know, it's nice to get the flowers. It's nice to have good foliage. We, it's nice to have good fall color. Not every shrub's going to have that, but we try to maximize uh, what we can. So tonight we're going to focus on the flowering shrubs. Now this is just a little bit of insight that I've pulled. Uh, again, these are not going to work in every single condition. They're not going to work in every location through the state. But it's a nice overview and also introducing some, uh, maybe some uh, shrubs that you've overlooked or maybe not have come in contact with. And hopefully some of these will be a review. So this one should be a review. Uh, we have several different forsythia now. We have the NDSU Metalark. Uh, Northern Sun has also been out for quite a while. Both are, are really hardy, good choices for us. We want to stay away from uh, the hybrids, uh, the X Intermedia. They are, uh, don't have the bud hardiness for us. Um, but again, these are going to be larger shrubs. And with any of the forsythias that are not on the standard, that shrub on a stick, 
we really want to put them in a location where they can shine early in the spring with those flowers and then fade away because it is what I, I always say it's a shrubby shrub it's not the most attractive tr uh, shrub once uh, the flowering is done uh, nice thing is it does tolerate deer it's very prune tolerant so you can shape it uh, so it does have some good qualities but a bigger shrub and not a lot going for it once it does uh, finish flowering. And again, here's back to that same picture of the northern sun on a standard. So allowing you to maybe control it a little bit better, keeping it into a better size. Uh, unfortunately though, uh, needs some good staking to develop because again, it wants to be a shrub. It also can sucker too. So it's a little bit more maintenance than just planting it and forgetting. Uh, potentillas, a lot of potentillas out there. Uh, great thing about them, long season of flowering, very low maintenance, uh, doesn't require much water, uh, tolerant to deer, tracks butterflies, a lot of good things going for it. You know, here's a pretty popular one that's still available in the market, again, an NDSG release. I don't want to focus on just that tonight, but just kind of look at some other ones. Uh, so there are a lot of different colors available, Pink Beauty. Uh, I don't know if the color is showing up uh, across the state there, but the pink, it actually is a really nice pink. Uh, from what I'm seeing, and maybe it's just the light in my eyes, if it doesn't look as pink as what, it, what I think it should. Um, and what a better way to go is with mango tango. It's just fun to say, hey, I got a mango tango. Uh, but a, a really nice orange. Uh, and then the happy face is, is a newer potentilla that's a nice white. So again, we don't have to be stuck with the same old yellow potentilla. We can use a lot of different colors. They're very florific. Uh, bloom time, again, even past frost uh, in a nice protected spot. Uh, rhododendron, uh, University of Minnesota has done a lot of work with the Northern Light series. Uh, again, we have to be a little bit weary on, or wary on the hardiness component here. You know, zone four, I uh, wouldn't really go probably a zone three with these. Also, they need good drainage. You know, they can't handle the wet feet. They, there's a lot of root uh, diseases. So we want to get them up in where they can get uh, drainage out of a kind of raised bed. But again, nothing really can beat uh, a nice rhododendron. Uh, the Canadian uh, Artist Series Rose. There's several of them. This is my favorite. I really like the Campfire Rose. Uh, they're breeding roses now to be a lot less uh, problematic, uh, more disease resistant, a lot less work. Don't have to worry about hardiness. This one's hardy to zone three. What I like about it is the color change. It starts out in a tighter bud, more of a yellow. And as it opens up, it turns into a yellow, pink, and then eventually will go to a pink. And it's supposed to resemble a campfire. It's a very, very attractive rose, again, with a lot less maintenance of our traditional roses from the past. Um, and also boasts that it will attract hummingbirds. Uh, Wygela, this is again another one where you could do zone four. If you're in a zone three, I would be a little hesitant, maybe in a spot that's more protected. Uh, but there's a lot of new ones out. This is kind of one of the standards now is Red Prince really nice uh, dark red color uh, medium size shrub you know we're looking at well medium to large five to six foot uh, but really nice accent and it blooms during the summertime so that's one thing i like to do when i uh, landscape is you want that spring flowering you know like our forsythia where it'd be more of a backdrop when other things are not flowering get that wow then when it's done it can kind of fade away and then you get the forefront uh, moving in uh, throughout the season. And Wajila, long bloom time all through the summer. Uh, French Lace is a little bit smaller one, uh, four to five foot. Uh, again, they also attract hummingbirds, really nice long bloom time. Uh, minuet, beautiful color. Uh, it's kind of a two-tone, uh, with the, the lighter kind of pink in the inside. Uh, so really, really nice. Uh, uh, kind of almost reminiscence of a lilac. So you get your nice early lilacs and then you can move into the minuet if you really like that more lilac, traditional lilac color. Uh, chokeberry, who doesn't want a chokeberry, right? That sounds so great. That's why in the nursery trade they're called aronia now. Uh, but again, multi-season interest. The flowers, they're very subtle, they're white, not really wow in your face. But what's great is that they do produce an edible fruit and oh, I thought I had 
another picture of it. Uh, nice edible fruit that you can mix, not really eat by itself, but it is really healthy, high in antioxidants. Uh, makes a great smoothie. They're actually better tasting after frost. So they get a little bit sweeter, but amazing. Really great red uh, burgundy fall color. So again, this is a nice one for ed escaping. Button bush. Now this may be one you're not familiar with. Uh, again, this is hardy zone four, maybe 3B in a protected spot. Uh, we have this out at our Absaraca research station doing very well. Um, and really distinct flower, having that, that white flower where it looks like almost like Sputnik from back in the 60s with the, the space program. But it has all these, uh, all the, the um, flower parts sticking out. It will produce a, a red fruit. Uh, and again, you get a really nice long season with it. It can be used as cut flowers. Uh, it's a smaller shrub, uh, three to four foot. Uh, there's a, several different cultivars. One I'm showing here is Sugar Shack, uh, and that's the one again that comes in a little bit smaller than, than the species. Uh, coral Berry. Uh, this one, the, the trademark is Proud Berry. And again, it's hardy to zone three. This is one where the flower is really not that exciting. It's fairly small, it, it's kind of a whitish pink. A uh, smaller shrub, it will be wider than it is tall, about three to four foot, four to five foot spread. Uh, but what's nice about it is that it has really showy fruit. So again, later in the season when everything else is done flowering, you still have that color in your yard and not just the green. Uh, they're also deer resistant. Uh, there's a close up of the fruit. It's, it's really cool. It's this you know, uh, purpley white color and just doesn't really look natural, but it's it's a beautiful, beautiful persistent fruit. Uh, Northern Pearls Pearl, Pearl Bush uh, cultivar is Northern Pearls, uh, and it gets its name because of the flower is a nice solid white, just a very pure white, and the petals are fused before it opens up, so it looks like a white pearl. Uh, larger shrub, six to eight foot, just as wide. Uh, and extremely tolerant to variable soil types and also drought tolerant. So that's another nice aspect too. So really nice, pretty, subtle white flower. And, and that's what I always look for too, is to have a diversity in color and in styles. So here's just a little bit of a close up. Uh, if you look on the right picture, you can see kind of central right where the, uh, the buds are that tight round kind of pearl look to them. They will open up to be a little bit more flamboyant, uh, but really nice, nice pretty white. Uh, any of the panicle hydrangeas, you know, becoming very common now. A lot of work and selection has been done on them. For us here, uh, they do very well. Uh, hardy zone four, again, once you get into that zone three, you know, maybe a little protected spot, uh, but a lot of different colors now. Here's Diamond Rouge, uh, really, really pretty, a, a deep kind of magenta color to it, uh, four to five foot tall, not really a spreader, more of an upright, which is really nice. Uh, what's neat about it, and here you can see the color, this is a lot like uh, uh, what we were just talking earlier where like with the campfire rose where it does a, a color transition and so you can see where it, it's coming out kind of that white and then it will fade into a deeper color because the flowers that we're seeing are actually uh, sterile they're not true flowers and that's what's great about the panicle hydrangeas is that they have really long flower life because they're not true flowers and so they don't have the process there of, of creating seed so they're there long term uh, and, and can be a really good asset to, to our gardens. Uh, Incredible is an arborescence, uh, slightly different species than the panicle, but again does very well. Hardy Zone 3 has those big mop heads, uh, which can be a little bit on the messy side, you know, uh, come the next year because you're going to want to do some deadheading to kind of remove all that. Um, but wow, what a show, you know, look at this uh, hedge, just amazing. Uh, but again, super variable when it comes to soil types, very low maintenance. But again, the flowers that we're seeing are sterile, so they're really persistent. Uh, here's just a photograph showing how large it is. Uh, so you can see in scale with a person's hand, and that's why they call them Incredible, just because they're so incredibly big. Uh, winter holly or winterberry holly. 
So here we actually have a deciduous holly. Uh, there's several different uh, cultivars. This one I think is, is kind of funny. It's berry poppins. Uh, again, very adaptable, uh, can handle wet locations, which is nice because again, we don't always have a perfect yard. And so it's nice to have uh, plants that will do well in the dry, some that will do better in the wet. Uh, this is also a native, uh, which is also nice because we really want to encourage natives to help out our pollinators. Uh, it does require a male to pollinate because one thing about the name, winter berry, you, you would expect then a berry because the flowers are kind of subtle, not too exciting, but it's the berry that, that really is. So you have to make sure you get a male to get the berries. So here's just a shot of those persistent berries. Uh, with berry poppins, they're more of a red. There are other cultivars that are yellow. So here's berry heavy gold, and then little goblin gold, which is uh, sold more as a uh, orange, even though it kind of looks reddish, but it's, it's on that orange side. Nine bark, we know does really well. Hardy zone three has no problems really whatsoever, no maintenance. Um, can basically plant it just about anywhere. It is native. Uh, lots of different colors now with the purple foliage types to the green to the gold foliage type. This is a new one that's out called Tiny Wine. Uh, it's kind of competing against uh, Little Devil. Uh, but again, giving us some smaller plants to be able to mix in as well. So this is uh, three to five foot tall. So the, again, the flowers are kind of subtle, um, but it really is more all about the, the combination of the flowers and that foliage color with that purple foliage. Spirea, we know there's a million spireas, but there's a new one called Double Play. Uh, double Play Big Bang, you know, it's like whoa, too much of a name, but uh, two to three foot tall. So it's a nice little compact plant. What's cool about it is that the foliage, when it emerges out, is more of an orange kind of golden color, and then it will fade off into a green, and then the flowers are this really nice uh, pinkish purple, which is kind of standard for spirea, but it's the foliage as it emerges out in the, in the uh, new season that really gives it that bang. Um, lilac, we can't go without talking about a lilac. Here's prairie petite lilac. This is awesome. Only three to four foot tall, and it's been documented three foot after 25 years. So this is a common lilac that will fit anywhere. Uh, great fragrance, very florific, just a beautiful, beautiful little lilac. Uh, attract butterflies, hummingbirds, fits just about anywhere. So here's just a close-up of the flowers. Traditional lilac, uh, it is a common lilac. Uh, and then we have a lot of the hybrids. Here's bloomerang, which is a repeat bloomer. You know, again, we want to get as much money uh, or much bang out of our money, and, and here we can get a nice rebloomer, super fragrant. Another new one, Scent and Sensibility, uh, really super fragrant. It's in the same line as Bloomerang, but it doesn't have as good of repeat bloom, so it hasn't. it's not being sold in the Bloomerang line. But you will get some repeat bloomers out of Scent and, scent and Sensibility, but it is a really super fragrant lilac. And then my my favorite you know why do you need to improve a lilac when we have dwarf korean lilac beautiful lilac prune tolerant planted just about anywhere as long as it doesn't stay wet uh and super florific and really really fragrant uh and here's just a shot of it now as a standard uh they're uh, trained them up as standards and you can't go wrong with that so with that those are my quick overview of some shrubs all right, thank you, Ties. Excellent. I tell you, I, I got the spring fever looking at those pictures. Those are spectacular. I love it. Okay, we got some questions already coming in and um keep coming, everybody. <clears throat> How about you mentioned Holly, the Ilex? Yeah. Is it did you see that's native to North Dakota? Uh I don't know if it's actually native to North Dakota. It's native into Minnesota. Okay. See, and that's the one thing we always have to worry about with the term native. You know, is it really, is right. it native to North Dakota? Is it native to the region? Is it native to the U.S.? And so we have to be careful with the term native. Okay, but at least it's, at least nearby native. Yes. To say that. How about the persistence of those winter berry fruit? Uh, anytime you have fruit that's persistent, you always have to be careful. Because the catalogs will say they'll be there all winter long, but we know better that wildlife, once they find them, they'll be gone. So they'll be there a while, but again, we are also helping promote uh, 
our wildlife as well with food source. So eventually they will find them. So are, are they going to be there for Christmas? Uh, holly decoration? Potentially. Depends on who finds them. Is it, it has a smooth leaf or a tiny uh, leaf? No, it, it's it's more of a smooth leaf. There There is a serrated edge, but it's not like our typical holly leaf that right. we're used to. Because a smooth leaf holly, when you bring it indoors for decoration, that means the man is in charge of the house for, oh, the, interesting. for the upcoming year. I did not know Just that. wondering if that was safe to bring in my house. I did not know that. How about, is uh, coral very edible? Good question. I should probably know that, but I don't. Is it persistent? It is, and again, it's the same, same thing, thing where, you know, Remember. eventually uh, lilac, or I see lilac, uh, wildlife will find it. Yeah. How about, uh, can you recommend any shrubs that have a, a nearly constant bloom? Uh, if you want constant bloom for the longest, yeah, the hydrangeas, because they have the sterile flowers, potentilla, uh, really long bloom time. Um, How about that rose you mentioned? That's, the rose, that's, that, a, that's, that's a, a really series long, of flushes. It's not it, a one-time flush. I agree. It definitely has a series of flushes. That's, that's such a great rose. Yeah, it looks great. Um, okay, how about, do any of these shrubs work um, under a north-facing bay window, like shady? Mm, well, I mean, there's some that will do the part shade, nothing that's going to handle extreme full shade, because anytime you're looking at a plant that's in a really, really shady spot, you're going to work, you know, problems are going to come out with it being leggy, it's going to grow out, mm -hmm. you won't get as many flowers. Uh, so you're going to compromise a lot of the, the good qualities of that plant. So maybe an evergreen. Yeah. Or how about a hydrangea? Did they take a little oh, shade? A hydrangea could definitely take shade, yeah. How about, uh, will the hydrangea paniculata rendia turn color even without an acidic soil? Yeah, that's a nice with paniculata. So that's a very good question because like the big leaf hydrangea is susceptible to our pH. So with high alkaline soil, it won't turn that nice blue. It'll stay pink. Uh, with the paniculata, it's not dependent upon pH. So you, the color that you buy is the color you get. Okay, that's good. And uh, I've got some hungry gardeners out there. Uh, how about that proud berry? Was that a coral berry? Coral berry, yeah. Is that edible? We you know, I should have I should have looked up all the edible things. I didn't I realize I was going to be so excited about edescaping. <laughs> They're starving out there. We need to do a talk on edescaping. <laughs> edible thing. That was last year. Oh, well, oh we my goodness. Eating, we weren't eating coral berries. I don't know. I've never eaten a coral berry. Or, I mean, how about aronia? They said that makes a good smoothie. Yeah, yeah. Aronia, you really got to mix it with something that. to to make it really palatable. Again, there's that edible versus palatable. It's really stringent, really bitter, but really healthy. So. Mix it in with some ice cream and yum yum. Okay, how about a? When would you prune a Korean lilac? Uh, well, with any of the lilacs, you want to make sure that you know you can prune when you need to prune, whenever you have time to prune. But if you're going to prune a lilac, realize that it's going to be on the uh, the last year's wood. So if you prune it, you want to prune it right after flowering. Because so the then you get that new growth that comes in. You enjoy the flowers. You get the new growth, which will then set the flower buds for next year. Uh, if you prune it before flowering, you don't, you're going to miss out. Right. Same with forsythia. That's another. Yeah, forsythia same, same way. Wait till after the, the yellow Yeah, but the best then. way to prune a forsythia is right at the base. Yep. <laughs> Maybe a little roundup too. Yep. Just kidding. <laughs> uh, can you recommend? Uh, flowering shrub that would do well as a privacy hedge oh boy um depends on you know do you want it all year round yeah. uh because with our deciduous shrubs obviously they're going to lose their leaves you know because even for scythia you can uh shape it into a nice privacy hedge because of its size uh but it's going to lose its leaves but it's fairly dense you know if you're looking for a privacy screen you know you may want to look more evergreen or how about like would arrowwood viburnum? Arrowwood would, yeah, but again, same thing. Once it loses its leaves, it's not as dense. Yeah. Um, are any of the newer nine barks less susceptible to powdery mildew? 
Well, that's what they're trying to really breed into because I know the little devil is supposed to be more tolerant of powdery mildew, a little more resistant. So the newer varieties, that's what they're saying. Um, again, you want to make sure you keep them in spots where there's going to be good airflow. How about uh, that button bush? Oh, wow, these people are so hungry. Button bush. Don't eat it. Don't eat no, a button kidding. bush. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you know, that is a good thing to say, Todd, right? Like, don't, unless you're sure. Unless you're sure. But don't. No, the button no. bush, it, it's such a unique flower that it's just, yeah. it's a good conversation. And like I said, it, it makes a nice cut flower, too. And you can really wow your friends with something that they've probably not seen. Right. I never saw it before. How about, uh, which of the lilacs suckers the least? Ooh. Or maybe which one to avoid? Yeah, which one to avoid? Um, that's a good question. I mean, because that's kind of what they're there for. Uh, you know, one thing, uh, several years ago, I had a chance to go over to Poland, and the coolest thing I saw over there was a uh, common lilac trained as tree form. Now, they had to maintain the suckering, but actually trained it as a tree, and it was gorgeous. But, uh, but yeah, you're going to be dealing with any type of suckering on the lilacs, you know, and you just have to, you just have to deal with it. Yeah, that's right. Okay, can you fertilize a hydrangea to get blue color? Uh, you, not necessarily fertilization, uh, but you're going to have to do soil modification with acidification. Uh, but that's, again, that's with your, uh, your big leaf, not your paniculata. Paniculata, you can't change that color. So when you buy the hydrangea, you got to be sure of the species. That, and you want the big leaf hydrangea, and you have to have it super acidic yep to turn it blue so best Good thing luck. best thing would be is if you're if you want that really nice blue hydrangea you need to make right. a raised bed so that way you can modify that soil and keep it modified you sink it in the ground into a regular bed it's going to be really hard to modify and stay modified that was top peat moss is good for that. Peat, well, peat is especially. really, really good, helpful. But it's it's going to be a, a lifelong battle. You're better yeah. off just trying to go with something else. Yeah. Uh, did you mention barberry bushes? You know, I did not talk about barberry at all. And because you're anti-barberry, or I well, just didn't give you enough time. Not anti-barberry, but I don't think of barberry when I think of a flower and shrub. That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> but it is it's a, it's a good one for directing traffic you know if you want people not to cut through an area plant barberry that's right keep the neighbor's dog out how about uh the canadian explorer series of roses are they yeah. still available yeah they are uh Where? i know i know jeffrey's nursery is one of the the um, releasers with the canadian series if you go to their site so anybody who buys through jeffrey's should be able to get them doesn't bailey nursery still i think bailey's yeah, they should the, only, the thing with Bailey's is that they're developing more of their own lines of material and they're dropping other people's lines of, of material. So, you know, I'm going to throw in my own question there because, uh, you know, there's so many cool plants, like you said, like that. So many we've never seen before, but how, what, what would be your strategy? Let's say I get really inspired and say, I got to have one of these coral berries. You know, how can I, what would be your recommendation how I can make that happen? Like, should I go to my garden? Should I go to my nursery right now? and tell them I, I want to have this specific cultivar of coral berry and then they can order it from Jeffries or Bailey's. Yeah. So yeah. don't wait for them because it, it no. may, may let, not be there. Exactly. Don't wait for them. You know, it is that double end uh, or double edged sword is that, you know, they're going to push what they think you want. And then you also need to go in and tell them what you want. So now's a good time to do that. Now's a great time to do it. Uh, Proudberry is not edible, we hear from Oliver County. Oh, good. Thank oh, you. There you go. Don't don't eat it. Uh, can you make a recommendation? What type of shrubs do best when they're exposed to a lot of wind in a part sun environment? Mm. Uh, well, I mean, anytime when you're exposed to a lot of wind, you just want to make sure that they're staying well watered. You know, I'd focus on ones that are more drought tolerant because you're going to get a lot of drying out with that wind on the leaves. Uh, avoid any of your uh, evergreen, your dwarf evergreen shrubs, because they'll burn up in that type of situation, especially in the wintertime, obviously. But uh, just make sure you got good moisture. And to make a soil acidic, sulfur. Oh, sulfur. And there's other acidifiers. Yeah, but sulfur is the best method. So, Todd, another 
inquiry, how come you didn't mention mock orange? You know, I was going to include mock orange, but again, that's another one where depending upon cultivar, a lot of the cultivars are zone five. Uh, we have zone four. And again, that was on that iffy. And I was like, well, so yeah, I was going to include it, but that was the one that I kind of took out because of time. Okay. Uh, where's Jeffrey's Nursery? Jeffrey's Nursery is a wholesale nursery up in Manitoba. Uh, so they don't sell directly to the public, but a lot of the nurseries in our area here buy from Jeffrey's. How about this uh, gardener in Morton County has some buried lines, and can you what shrub can you plant that does not root too deep? Is that really a concern? Uh, I wouldn't really be too concerned with that, because uh, with shrubs, they do have a fairly shallow root system, and, and you shouldn't have any issues, really. Yeah. How about, is endless summer... Is that a small leaf hydrangea? That's a big leaf. That's, That's a macrophylla. That's so, turns blue. Yep. So we have that on campus, and it's a beautiful pink. Even though it's okay. Little, it's blue. Uh, God, we're just power pack full of questions. Oh, Towner Nursery does not buy from Jeffries. I saw that pop up. You need to go to a garden center. Also, I should say this presentation is archived, so. And we'll get it on on the internet in a day or two. So I'm sure you want to see it again and uh, share it with your friends in case you missed something. Also, please download your handouts. All this good information is there. Um, what else, my executive producer? Did I miss anything here? Um, you think we got it licked here? Um, Okay, Todd, all I got to do is say thank you. That yeah, was a no great problem. presentation. Yeah. We really appreciate it. And uh, we're going to take a quick five-minute break and move on to the next talk, everybody. All right.